Today's scripture reading comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 15 through 18. That's 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 15 through 18. If you have your Bibles with you, please follow along. If not, you can follow along on the screen beside me. That's 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 15 through 18. Receive now God's word. But I have made no use of any of these rights, nor am I writing these things to secure any such provision, for I would rather die than have anyone deprive me of my ground for boasting. For if I preach the gospel, that gives me no ground for boasting, for necessity for necessity is laid upon me. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel, for if I do this of my own will, I have a reward. But if not of my own will, I am still entrusted with a stewardship. What then is my reward? That in my preaching, I may present the gospel free of charge, so as not to make full use of my right in the gospel. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. We come back today uh, in our study in the letter of 1 Corinthians, and we last left off in the middle of chapter 9. In the first 14 verses of this chapter, Paul went to great lengths to establish his rights as an apostle of Christ, and he did this through a slew of rhetorical questions. No less than 17 of them, if you just skim through the first 14 verses, each one demanding an obvious answer which served to settle the matter that indeed the Apostle Paul has the right to be provided for and supported. Roughly speaking, the 17 questions can be divided up into three categories. Number one, an argument from common practice. Number two, an argument from Scripture. And number three, an argument from the teachings of our Lord Jesus himself. No matter what field or area of work you look at, whether it's agriculture or commerce or the military or even the temple, whether religious or secular, Jewish or Gentile, it doesn't matter. It is expected that the one who labors receives his wages. Even the ox gets to eat the grain that it treads so that to deprive a human being of this right would be inhumane. Common practice bears this out. Scripture bears this out. Jesus himself bears this out. Paul goes to great lengths to establish his rights, not just as an apostle, but as a human being. But then, after 17 rhetorical questions, 14 verses, three arguments, Paul concludes by saying, Nevertheless, we have not made use of this right, but we endure anything rather than put an obstacle in the way of the gospel of Christ. He establishes his rights only to relinquish them. And that verse that I just read for you captures the main point of this entire chapter. Relinquishing one's rights for the sake of the gospel. Relinquishing one's rights for the sake of the gospel. That's what this is all about. And it's really in today's passage that Paul will go on to expand upon this idea. Now to remind you, in chapter 9, Paul has moved away from exhortation. He has moved away from explanation. And his plan of attack, if you will, is now example. He's not trying to give you doctrinal principles for why you should relinquish your rights. He's simply offering his own example. But as was pointed out two weeks ago, in Paul's example, there is an implicit command. And that command is, imitate me. That's true, by the way, not just of Paul, but of the entire Bible, not least of all Jesus himself. When you read through the Gospels, you're not just to pay attention to Jesus' explicit commands and instructions You're also to pay attention to his example, to what he does, how he does it, why he does it. So that you could say that the entire life of Christ, as recorded in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, is just one big command. Imitate me. Paul certainly took this to heart, and that's why he can offer himself as another example. Because as he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1, at the end of this section, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. Examples serve to model, they serve to instruct, to challenge, and to motivate, to show how something theoretical can be practically applied, 
and sometimes even to convict and to shame, to wake us up from our spiritual sloth, to spur us on to spiritual strength. And I am quite confident that as we look at the way in which Paul chose to live, his example will serve to do all of the above. I have divided up the rest of chapter 9 into three points, and each of these points gives us a glimpse into the mind and heart of Paul. They help us understand what gets him up in the morning, what makes him tick, why he does what he does. Here they are. Point number one, Paul's source of pride. Point number two, Paul's sense of priority. And point number three, Paul's self-controlled pursuit for the prize. This morning, we'll be looking at just the first of those three points, Paul's source of pride. But before we get into the text, let's pray one more time. Father in heaven, we come before your text now. And as we once again look at the example that Paul sets before us, as we look at the life of Paul, may we not just admire him from afar, But may you place it upon our hearts to sincerely and diligently try to imitate this apostle of yours precisely because he imitated you. Through Paul's example, we ask that you would conform us into the image of your son, Jesus Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Verse 15. But I have made no use of any of these rights, nor am I writing these things to secure any such provision. For I would rather die than have anyone deprive me of my ground for boasting. Paul begins this section by repeating what he'd said in the middle of verse 12, that he has not made use of his rights. And so we pick up right where we left off. To remind you, Paul had deemed it necessary to refuse support from the Corinthians lest this presented an obstacle to the gospel. And we spent some time discussing why this would have been the case, why Paul's receiving pay would have been an obstacle. We won't go through the whole thing again, but suffice to say, it was intimately tied to the culture of Corinth, specifically to the patronage system that governed the relationships in virtually every aspect of that society. In a city such as Corinth, where social status and advancement meant everything Giving and receiving gifts was an incredibly important means of establishing and sustaining various relationships, your professional network, if you will. If Paul had accepted the support of presumably the wealthier members of this church, there was a high chance that he would find himself indebted exclusively to them. He would be bound to to serve their interests as a client is bound to his patron, and obligated to repay them, in his case, through his services. If that were to happen, not only would the authority of his message be compromised, but his ability to communicate to the weak, the poor, the people of low standing, the nobodies, access to them would be cut off. An obstacle would be raised, hindering the advancement of the gospel in Corinth, and Paul could not have that. Fortunately for the Corinthians, Paul was more than ready And he was more than willing to relinquish his rights for their sake as well as for the sake of the gospel. Now, before moving on any further, Paul feels the need to clear up a potential misunderstanding. He anticipates that the Corinthians might take his extended defense of his rights as basically an indirect plea for money to get paid. And so he clarifies here, nor am I writing these things to secure any such provision. I'm not playing some kind of mind game with you, he says. I'm not trying to manipulate you into giving me money where I say I don't want it only to make you feel bad and insist that I take it and then for me to actually take it. I'm not playing that game, Paul says. I really don't want your money. In fact, I would rather die than have anyone deprive me of my ground for boasting. This is one of those sentences that you have to look at in the original Greek in order to fully appreciate. In the Greek it is evident that Paul begins a thought that is then cut off by an exclamatory interjection. Literally, this is what he writes. For I would rather die, that's the thought that's begun, but then all of a sudden it's cut off. No one will deprive me 
of my ground for boasting. This is smoothed over in the English, but it's almost as though the mere thought of receiving support evokes in this apostle emotional outburst. It gets him worked up, upset even, as he thinks about this, for I would rather die. No one will deprive me of my ground for boasting. Given the circumstances, given the culture of Corinth, Paul does not consider it robbery that the Corinthians aren't paying him. Rather, he considers it robbery should they insist on paying him. Now, in verses 16 through 18, Paul is going to explain what exactly is his ground for boasting. To put that differently, his source of pride. But before we even go there, I think we need to discuss this concept of boasting a little bit. The word there is kaukema. I think it's unfortunate that it's often translated as boasting because in the English, to boast carries a very negative connotation. When we hear that word, we think of bragging or being prideful or self-congratulating. In other words, we think of it as a sin. However, just sticking with the English for now, the words to boast or even to be proud are not necessarily negative. They're not necessarily sins. I want you to think about this. What does boasting reveal about a person? The same thing could be asked of pride. These are obviously overlapping, overlapping concepts. What does pride reveal about a person? You see, boasting actually gives us an incredibly profound insight into a person's psyche because it reveals what that person truly values or cherishes in the depths of his heart. So some people boast about their job. Others boast about their position or title. Others still about their achievements, their success, their degrees. Some about their money or possessions. Sometimes it's about their significant other, their trophy wife or their trophy girlfriend. Many boast about their family or heritage or culture. And the list could go on and on. And for most people, it's usually a combination of several of those things that I just mentioned. What you boast about What makes you proud gives us a profound, meaning deep. It gives us a deep insight into the things that you value or cherish most. A good alternative translation to the word kalkema is glory, to glory in something. And I think that word is a little bit more neutral. It brings to light another aspect or nuance of this concept. When you think about glorying in something, what do you typically think of? For me, the first thing that came to mind was those ancient war movies, specifically the movie Troy. Near the beginning of that movie, for those of you who have seen it, King Agamemnon enlists the services of the great Achilles to go and fight for him in Troy. And Achilles, who's more of a lone wolf, he's, a, he's kind of a mercenary for hire. He's trying to decide whether or not he should go. And in that process, he has a conversation with his mother. And this is what she says to him. She says, if you stay in Larissa, that's his hometown. If you stay in Larissa, you'll find peace. You'll find a wonderful woman. You will have sons and daughters, and they will have children. And they will love you. And when you're gone, they will remember you. But when your children are dead and their children after them, your name will be lost. If you go to Troy, glory will be yours. They will write stories about your victories for thousands of years and the world will remember your name. But if you go to Troy, you will never come home for your glory walks hand in hand with your doom. That last phrase in particular, I think, is very accurate. Glory walks hand in hand with your doom. Your glory is the one thing that you will cling to, to your very grave. Of course, Achilles decides to go, otherwise there'd be no story. And on his way to Troy, I think more of you will remember this scene. As his boat is approaching the shores, he gives one of those inspiring speeches to his troops. And he says, my brothers of the sword, I would rather fight beside you than any army of thousands. Let no man forget how menacing we are. We are lions. Do you know what's there waiting beyond that beach? Remember what he says? 
immortality. Take it. It's yours. For Achilles, what was his glory? Immortality. Fame. The history books remembering his name. Women and children forever singing of his unparalleled skills with the sword. You see, just like boasting, what you glory in is reflective of what you esteem above all else. Achilles was willing to sacrifice having a wife, having children, having a happy family and peace for fame and power. So returning to our text now. Boasting in and of itself is not a sin. What's more important is what you boast about, your reasonings for boasting. And depending on that, boasting can either be a sin that is rooted in idolatry, or it can be an act of righteousness that magnifies the one true God. And so what do you boast in? What's your glory? Well, here's Paul's, verse 16. For if I preach the gospel, that gives me no ground for boasting, for necessity is laid upon me. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. Before telling us what it is, Paul first tells us what it's not. The source of Paul's pride is not merely his preaching the gospel. Preaching in and of itself is not something he can boast about. It's not something he can take credit for. There's no glory he gains by doing it because necessity is laid upon him. To put that differently, he is compelled to do it. As a matter of fact, so strong is this compulsion that not to preach would result in a woe. Woe to me, he says. You can understand that as a curse. Think of the seven woes that Jesus pronounces upon the scribes and the Pharisees in Matthew chapter 23. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, for you do this, you do that, you do all these things that are hypocritical. Jesus pronounced a curse upon the religious leaders of his day. Likewise, Paul understands that failure to preach for him would result in severe punishment. Now, it may be tempting to take this verse to be simply referring to Paul's obedience to the Great Commission. Woe to me if I don't obey the Great Commission and preach the gospel. If this were the case, that same necessity, the same threat of punishment would then be placed upon every believer since the Great Commission is issued to all believers. But that is not what Paul's referring to. When he talks about this necessity that is laid upon him, Paul's specifically referring to his call as an apostle. And not just that, Paul is deliberately paralleling his call to the apostleship with the way in which God called the Old Testament prophets. Just as the prophets were compelled to prophesy, so also Paul, as an apostle, is compelled to proclaim the gospel. That's what Paul means by necessity. When we look at the Old Testament, we see that again and again, the heavy hand of God compelled the prophets to speak regardless of their will or their desire. The prophets themselves felt as though they had no choice in the matter. Moses had to prophesy to Pharaoh. Jonah had to prophesy to Ninevites. Amos to Israel. Jeremiah to Judah. None of them wanted to do it. There's an especially close parallel between Paul and Jeremiah. Listen to the way in which Jeremiah wrestled with his call. Jeremiah chapter 20 verse 9. If I say... I will not mention him or speak any more in his name. There is in my heart, as it were, a burning fire shut up in my bones, and I am weary with holding it in, and I cannot. Jeremiah had the unenviable task of proclaiming a message of destruction and judgment upon his own people. Understandably, he didn't want to do it. He even resisted it. But when he did, the words that he had to proclaim burned in his bones so that he could not hold it in. Furthermore, like Paul, Jeremiah also goes on to express a desire to die and pronounces a woe upon himself. Jeremiah 20, verse 14. Cursed be the day on which I was born. The day when my mother bore me, let it not be blessed. Cursed be the man who brought the news to my father. A son is born to you. Jeremiah says, I wish I'd never been born. In other words, he's saying, I wish I was dead. Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 19, Woe is me because of my hurt, 
My wound is grievous, but I said, truly, this is an affliction, and I must bear it. One more, Jeremiah 15, 10. Woe is me, my mother, that you bore me, a man of strife and contention to the whole land. All of them curse me. As a consequence of his prophesying, the people of Israel persecuted Jeremiah so that he described his calling as an affliction that he was forced to bear. Both Paul and Jeremiah experienced the weight of their calling as an inescapable necessity. Both Paul and Jeremiah used the vivid language of death and curses, but there's, of course, a major difference between the two, whereas Jeremiah wished that he was dead so that he could be relieved of his ministry. Paul says he would rather die than give up his ministry, whereas Jeremiah bitterly described his call to preach as a burdensome curse. Paul says he is cursed, if he doesn't preach. And this difference, by the way, doesn't hinge upon the fact that Paul is more holy or more righteous than Jeremiah, but it has everything to do with the contents of their proclamation. Jeremiah, again, had the unenviable task of proclaiming judgment and destruction. Paul has the enviable privilege of proclaiming forgiveness and redemption. So unlike Jeremiah, Paul is more than happy to do whatever it takes to proclaim this good news. He is even eager to do so. Either way, the call is from above. There is a divine compulsion to their ministry. The servant himself, whether it's the, whether it's the prophet or the apostle, has no say in the matter. And this is precisely the point Paul continues to emphasize in verse 17. Take a look. For if I do this of my own will, I have a reward. But if not of my own will, I am still entrusted with a stewardship. It would be one thing, Paul says, if I preach the gospel of my own will voluntarily. Then I would be entitled to some kind of a reward. But this is not the case. I don't preach out of my own initiative. I'm not preaching out of the graciousness of my own heart. But I perform it as a duty. I am still entrusted with a stewardship. There's that analogy again. If you remember in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, Paul had said, this is how one should regard us, us as in apostles. This is how one should regard us as slaves of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Paul there explicitly ties together the idea of a slave and a steward. To remind you, some slaves in first century Palestine, some slaves were appointed to the role of a steward or an estate manager. So Paul's point here, I think, is quite clear. As a steward, if Paul is simply executing the tasks that his master has instructed him to do, what is there to boast about? What can he take credit for? Neither the task itself nor the accomplishment of the task, since as a slave he's bound to do it. He's not like a free man whose services are voluntary. Now, just to clarify, the point of this analogy is not to give expression to his attitude. Paul is not suggesting that his ministry is a drag, that he's doing this reluctantly and slavishly. As we've seen already, he's more than happy to do this. The point is simply to underscore the fact that the performance of a duty is nothing to be proud of. The performance of a duty is nothing to be proud of. This reminds us of Jesus' parable in Luke chapter 17. And I want you to note here that whereas Paul is describing a necessity that has been laid upon him specifically as an apostle, Jesus in this parable is talking to all believers. And so the applicability of this principle is much broader. In Luke chapter 17, starting in verse 7. Jesus says, will any of you who has a servant plowing or keeping sheep say to him when he's come in from the field, come at once and recline at table? Will he not rather say to him, prepare supper for me and dress properly? Serve me while I eat and drink and afterward you will eat and drink. Does he thank the servant because he did what was commanded? So you also, when you have done all that you were commanded, say, we are unworthy servants we have only done what was our duty. That's the attitude that Jesus says the believer ought to have. We are unworthy servants. We have only done what was our duty. 
And that's exactly the attitude that Paul embodies in our passage, isn't it? The key word there is unworthy. If you acknowledge that you are unworthy to even be a slave of Christ, to be a part of his household, you will not have the audacity to take credit for mere obedience. Mere obedience. So then what is Paul's boast? We looked at what it's not. So then what is it? What is his source of pride? Verse 18. What then is my reward? That in my preaching I may present the gospel free of charge. So as not to make full use of my right in the gospel. Two things to note about that first phrase. What then is my reward? First of all, within the context of our passage, reward is clearly being paralleled to Paul's ground for boasting or a source of pride. And so you can think of those two things as the same. Second, Paul switches from the concept of boasting to the concept of reward because he's sticking with the analogy of a slave or a steward. And this actually highlights something very important about this concept of reward or boasting. From whom does a steward receive his reward? Is it from the other slaves that the steward is managing? Obviously not. It's from his master. Just a moment ago, I pointed out how boasting in and of itself is not a sin. What's more important is what you boast about. Well, let me add to that. What's also critical is who you're boasting to. Paul does not boast in front of men. He doesn't boast to men. He doesn't seek his reward from them. He seeks it from God. Bearing that in mind, I think you've noticed, but we've come back full circle from verse 15. Paul had said there, I'm not establishing my rights so as to coerce you into giving me money. I would rather die than have you deprive me or rob me of my ground of boasting. And now what is his boast? Simply this, that he preaches free of charge. Free of charge. I don't know about you, but when I first read that, it just kind of struck me as somewhat cliche. It made me think, come on, Paul, you are just trying to be overly paradoxical here because he's basically saying my reward is to receive no reward. But that's not quite what he's saying. Once again, I can't stress this enough. Pay attention here because this passage, especially this verse, gives us such a deep insight into the mind and heart of the Apostle Paul. I don't know if you've ever felt this way before, but when you meet someone who can rightly be considered a genius, you kind of want to look inside his brain and examine how his mind is ticking how he processes things, because there's clearly something about him that's different, that's special. That's how I often feel when I look at the Apostle Paul. So I was pleasantly surprised when I saw how this verse basically slices his brain. It exposes first the contents inside. Paul's not saying my reward is receiving no reward. He's actually pointing to an actual reward, something that he's actually proud of. And remember, what makes you proud, what you boast of, reveals what you truly value and cherish. Given the context of our passage, we have to interpret verse 18 as completing the thought that was introduced in verses 16 and 17. Paul realizes that, one, he can't boast about being an apostle. That wasn't his choice. Acts chapter 9, Paul was on the road to Damascus in order to persecute Christ when Christ suddenly appeared in a blinding light, arrested his efforts, and violently turned his life around. In fact, even before then, Galatians chapter 1, Paul writes that God had set him apart before he was even born. His call to be an apostle was graciously determined before his existence. He can't take credit for this. Two, Paul also realizes he can't boast about the work that he does as an apostle. He can't boast about preaching and teaching. He can't boast about the inspired letters that he's writing since these are nothing more than tasks that he's been instructed to carry out as Christ's servant. But, sticking with the analogy of stewardship, Paul is not content 
to simply do what he's told. He wants so badly to be able to boast about something to his master, to his God, to his father. He wants the reward. He wants the acknowledgement. He wants to hear his master say, well done, my good and faithful servant. He wants so badly to imitate Christ. But you can see his conundrum, don't you? How can you imitate Christ without showing grace? And how can you show grace when everything you're doing is out of compulsion? You see, being an apostle had placed Paul in this unique predicament where all of his responsibilities and all of his duties were so much higher than the average Christian. And yet in spite of that, he's still trying to figure out, how can I show grace? How can I make my father proud? So he's thinking real hard, and it dawns upon him. Well, I can't boast about my position, since God's the one who appointed me as an apostle. I can't boast about my work, since God has commanded me to preach. But God never commanded me to preach for free. And so Paul decides that as a policy, I will preach for free. That's the one thing I get to choose. That's the one thing that's voluntary. That's the one thing that I can give, not out of compulsion, but freely. That's the one area in which I can strive to show grace. In other words, it dawns upon the Apostle Paul, and here's the key. It dawns upon him that what he chooses to do with his freedom is really the only part of his life that presents him with the opportunity to be like Christ. Let me repeat that for you. What he chooses to do with his freedom is the only part of his life that presents him with the opportunity to be like Christ. By the way, Paul didn't do this just for the Corinthians in Acts chapter 20, speaking to the elders of, of the Ephesian church. He says, you yourselves know that these hands, he's referring to his own hands, these hands ministered to my necessities and to those who were with me. Not only did he provide for himself, but he provided for his team. In all things, I've shown you that by working hard in this way, we must help the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus. You see, it's all about imitating Christ for him. How he himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 9. For you remember, brothers, our labor and toil. We work night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you while we proclaim to you the gospel of God. And take a look at this. See how stringently Paul applied this principle to himself. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 8. Nor did we eat anyone's bread without paying for it. So even when some offered him free food, he refused to take it for free. He insisted on paying for it. And why? He continues to say in that same passage, it was not because we do not have that right. Paul has the right. But it was to give you in ourselves an example to imitate. An example of what? An example of Christ. And that's more or less what he's doing in our passage as well, isn't it? So Paul did this at least for the Corinthians, the Ephesians, and the Thessalonians. Now that is specific to the apostle. For him, imitating Christ translated into preaching for free. But what about for us? Applying this principle doesn't necessarily translate into the same thing for us. That's why after stating the specific, Paul goes on to state the general principle. That in my preaching I may present the gospel free of charge, that's specific to Paul, so as not to make full use of my right in the gospel. That's the general principle. That's the governing principle. So let's think about how this applies to us. Just as Paul is able to imitate Christ when he preaches for free, we are able to imitate Christ, to display his grace when we don't make full use of our rights in the gospel. The word for make full use is katakresasthai, 
We've seen this before in chapter 7 when Paul talked about how those who have dealings with this world should live as though they had no dealings with it. Literally, Paul says, as though they did not make full use of it. As was pointed out then, this is a compound word, kata, kresastai, the prefix kata serves to intensify the root verb. So it's not just making use or taking advantage of an opportunity, but it's making full use, taking full advantage of all of your rights and freedom. So back in our verse, not making full use of your rights and freedom is the only way in which you will be able to reflect the grace of Christ. As Paul says in Philippians chapter 2, Christ, who did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself. Christ had the right to remain on his throne along with his Father. But he shows grace by relinquishing that right in order to save his people. So the only way in which you can imitate that Christ is if you too display that kind of grace. So let me spell this out for you even more. As a Christian, there are certain responsibilities that you have, duties to which you've been called. If you're wondering what those are, just read the Bible, the whole Bible, all the explicit commands and prohibitions, what you must and must not do. All those are your responsibilities and duty. You're called to obey. And for that very reason, precisely because they are duties, performance of them cannot be your grounds of boasting. You cannot take credit. You cannot be proud of simply doing what you're supposed to do. It's funny, isn't it, when you observe children because they're still in the process of figuring this out. What's a responsibility versus what's done voluntarily? So sometimes little kids will clean up their room and they'll drag their mom over and say, see, see, I've cleaned up my room. And they'll boast about what they've done, wanting to receive some kind of compliment. And it's amazing to see how children thrive off of praise. But at some point, the mom will stop saying good job. She will stop rewarding the child and simply tell her, Honey, that's actually what you're supposed to do anyways. Obedience is not something for you to boast about. So that along with Paul, we ought to say to ourselves, Woe is me if I do not obey. But here's the beauty of the Christian life. God gives us certain rules and regulations, but his commands are not exhaustive. They're not meant to govern every minute aspect of your life. Don't take that statement out of context. What I'm saying is this. That in addition to commands, God also gives us certain rights and freedom. By the way, the rights that Paul has in view are legitimate rights. Rights that God has given you and that he even protects so that you can enjoy them. And we know that because of that one phrase, in the gospel. These are rights that have been provided for you in the gospel. I legitimately have the right to receive support and provisions from this church. I legitimately have the freedom to enjoy all foods, clean or unclean, doesn't matter. I legitimately have the right to enjoy a glass of wine with my steak. I legitimately have the right to spend my free time in the way that I please for leisure, recreation, to go to the theater, to watch a game, to take a day trip to New York, to simply enjoy God's creation in the park. I'm free to do all of those things so long as I'm not neglecting my duties. My enjoyment of these things is not a sin. But this is what you have to understand. That as with Paul, it is precisely what you choose to do with this freedom. How you choose to exercise or make use of your rights in the gospel that presents you with opportunities to be like Christ. Do you understand? You cannot relinquish your responsibilities. That would be a sin. 
the only thing that you can relinquish, the only thing that you can freely give is your rights. That's the only area of your life in which you can truly exhibit grace. Giving to the poor is nothing to boast about. Attending church is nothing to boast about. Reading his word and praying is nothing to boast about. Serving in and of itself is nothing to boast about. None of these things can be grounds for your boasting so that you're forced to go above and above and beyond mere compulsion in order to exhibit the grace of Christ. And when you do, when you sacrifice and when you share in the sufferings of Christ, you hold on to that and let no one take it away from you because it fills your heart with a sense of pride. That sacrifice is your reward, for the Bible tells me so, that the Father's pleasure shines down upon those who make themselves last. And it gives us the inestimable promise that he who shares in the sufferings of Christ will also share in his glory. That is what Paul is after. It's not some cliche statement, my reward is no reward. Now, he's got a real reward he's looking to. This is the source of his pride. Not that he's an apostle, not that he preaches, but that he has the privilege to freely give up his rights in order to more effectively advance the gospel, in order to more clearly show the Corinthians the heart of Jesus Christ himself. This is what he boasts about. Not to the Corinthians, not to men, but to God, to his master, to his father in heaven. As a child runs to her parents and says, come, come, see what I've done. Paul runs to his father and says, come, come, see what I've done. You've told me to lead, so I led your church. You told me to preach, so I preached. But I wanted to do so much more for you. And so I did it all for free. What about you? What is your boast and what is your source of pride? Next time, we will be looking at Paul's sense of priority. Let's pray. Father in heaven, you have given us so many good things to enjoy, to take pleasure in, to take advantage of. The greatest gift of which is your son, Jesus Christ. Father, we confess that often we selfishly make use of these rights in the gospel. We don't look for opportunities to show the grace of Christ to others. We confess that we fall short of the example that Paul sets forth in his own life. Father, you have given us this freedom so that we might freely give ourselves, so that we might advance the gospel in this world, to let your kingdom come so that as many people as possible might praise your name. Father, help our hearts be more focused upon the treasures of heaven that you've set before us. Help us not dwell upon the things that are created, no matter how good they are, but may we fix our eyes upon the creator. Father, we ask that you would fill our hearts with a desire to please you. May your pleasure be our ultimate reward. May we be able to boast to you as a child does to his father. And we thank you that we can even call you Father, and that indeed you take pleasure in the actions of sinful men. We recognize that you take delight in us precisely because in us you see an image of your Son, Jesus Christ, and so we thank you for him. We pray these things in his saving name. Amen.